you very much to the two witnesses. Thank you to Mr. Logan, Mr. McGar. Really helpful, very succinct and concise, if I may say. And you've really brought great clarity to bear on the provisions in the scheme uh, that are before us. And uh, I must say, for me personally, listening to you, it was very refreshing because I was involved in the previous, uh, under the previous government, uh, as a senator seeking to try and um, achieve a workable framework for individuals, for adopted people to access their information. And we kept coming up against the same barrier that you've sort of identified as underlying this scheme, which is this, um, I suppose, this, this insistence that the inf information rights would have to be balanced against privacy rights of natural or birth parents, particularly birth mothers or natural mothers, and that this balancing could only be achieved through the introduction of a somewhat cumbersome process involving, as you've said, I mean, um, Simon, I think you pointed out criminal penalties at one point. Uh, uh, the, you know, the most recent iteration in this scheme is some improvement, but it still starts from that place that you've both identified of... Um, of a balancing, not seeing a right to information as an unfettered right, but rather seeing it as something that had to be balanced and in many cases had to be, uh, uh, I suppose, um, you know, was actually overridden by a right to privacy, a right to privacy, which, you know, is 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 really being being used against those uh, who are seeking this information uh, and certainly from many mothers themselves, birth mothers and natural mothers themselves, isn't something that they've necessarily asserted. So, you know, I suppose, thank you for your for the clarity. Could I ask two specific questions? First, what do you both have to say about the question that we, this issue that we've constantly come up against, this issue that um, information can't be, we can't legislate for information in an unfettered way, according apparently to attorney general advice over different attorneys general, because of this issue about privacy rights and balancing. Do you have any, what do you have to say on that? Because that's been this ob obstacle that's been put in our way and put in the way, much more importantly, of adopted people for far too long. And secondly, um, given the clarity of your legal, of, of the approach you're suggesting, how do we as a committee proceed then in our recommendations in this pre legislative scrutiny stage? Should we say, therefore, that there is no requirement, and in fact it's in breach of GDPR, for us to be pl put placing these sort of cumbersome bureaucratic obstacles as I've described them, the meeting and so forth, uh, and should we instead sweep that away and start with a clean slate in terms of right to information. I'd love to hear your views and thank you again. I'm going to preempt Fred because I got to my mute button before he did. So um, uh, it, to answer the first question, let us imagine that there is no attempt at national legislation on this issue and that the, the requests for access to information are addressed solely under the GDPR. The GDPR provides for the balancing of rights within its own framework. It doesn't require additional legislation to try and legislate for that balancing. The balancing of rights is inherent to, uh, to the GDPR. And what has to be done is it has to be recognized what are the rights that are being looked at? What are the rights that are being applied? who has rights, and there's a sequence of questions that need to be asked. First of all, one needs to know who is alive and who is dead, because there are rights that accrue to people who are alive uh, under European law, which uh, you simply lose on, your, uh, on becoming dead. And it has been one of the more uh, odd sights of the, uh, uh, the last couple of months. Like Fred, I also have been representing people looking for information in relation to their, their early life uh, as adopted people, um, that we have seen assertions of rights in respect of the rights of dead people and an attempt to read that fact that the people who are deceased, are deceased have uh, data protection rights, an attempt to read that in such a way as to assert that records relating to dead people are exempt from the GDPR, as opposed to uh, the obvious reading, which is that dead people no longer have their GDPR rights. But of course, if the records relating to dead people also relate to people who are still living, then those records are still amenable to access under the GDPR. And unfortunately, and I'm confident that, uh, that the other witness will also have tales to tell on this front, unfortunately, we have met 
what are sometimes appear to be certainly misguided and occasionally perverse readings of GDPR and uh, in attempts to try and access information. So the core of the answer to my question, uh, to your second question, is I think we have an administrative problem. We have all the legislation that is required here. What we are lacking is the administrative guidance that will see the proper in, uh, interpretation of GDPR being applied by the agencies of the state and multiple agencies, uh, uh, I would say. So, so this appears to me that it is the uh, the classic case of a ministerial circular. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one would circulate a letter with a guidance note attached, which would have a general scheme which scheme could be used by all parties for the app describing the application of subject access requests to all the records that the different entities would hold. And attempting to be granular and saying this will be applied to that kind of record and this will be applied to this kind of record, the approach seen in these heads of bills seems to me to be, uh, as Fred said, starting in the wrong place. The right place is to start with principle and then from that, derive a scheme of approach to requests for subject access requests, whether they be from adopted people or other interested parties, and that that scheme of, uh, uh, of access would then be applied across all the organisations. And really only a ministerial uh, direction uh, note will apply there, but it does not require a... Uh, it does not require a piece of legislation. It doesn't require any additional laws. It simply is a guidance note for good administration. Do you want to come in on this? Yep. Um, so the, this thing about the balancing comes from a, an old case called IoT, which is being misinterpreted. That, that was a that was a, diff, a different issue. And I've written a paper with uh, Maeve McDonough and David Kenny and a few others that maybe some of the committee members are aware of, setting out why you don't need to have that balancing case by case individual balancing test in any uh, access legislation. And I'd just refer to that. I'd also point out that in I think nearly every single other EU jurisdiction, there is a system of open access to adoption information uh, with the same, exactly the same legislation, the GDPR, including the UK and Northern Ireland before they left the EU. Um, the, if it's a constitutional issue, the GDPR takes primacy over the constitution. doesn't matter what the constitution says. Uh, and I think just as legislators, the, the idea is that the legislature will set the parameters for the balancing in the legislation. Uh, so, and you have wide discretion as legislatures. So it, the, the, the principle is that you, as the, the democratic people who pass legislation, are best placed to make that balancing test. And, and I think it can be done on a, not, that doesn't require a case by case basis. So for example, as I said, we have open access to birth certs. So there is like, I'm always baffled by this. Everyone knows who their mother and father is, more or less, or 99.99%. We don't have privacy as between children and parents. You know, so where does this right of privacy come from? That's the question I'd ask. If we have an open birth certs register, I can go in and find out the names and address names of all your parents. And it's even more bizarre for adoption because it's actually easier for people who live locally to somebody who gave up a child for adoption to find out the birth cert of the child because they will know the name and the date of birth true local knowledge, whereas the adopted person makes is harder to find it. So if we genuinely had a right of privacy in relation to who your, your birth mother was, these records would be secret by true legislation. And then a second point is, I think you have to proceed from the basis that this legislation is to give full or further effect to the GDPR rights. You, you, you just can't start from here where it's kind of assumed that this is a new right. If you don't start from that point of departure, there will just be a massive conflict between this legislation and GDPR. I just thank you both so much for your clarity. I mean, I entirely agree with you about the misinterpretation of IoT, but unfortunately, you know, every time as legislators we've raised this, it has been, we have been told, we have been, it's been brought back against us, if you like, and it, and this uh, need to, allegedly to balance constitutional rights uh, has been has been raised. So I thank you again for your clarity.